Hi, and welcome to the Two Texts Podcast. I'm here with my co-host, John Andrews, and my name is David Harvey. This is a podcast of two friends from two different countries meeting every two weeks to talk about the Bible. Each week, we pick one text to talk about, which invariably leads us to talking about two texts and often many more. This season, we're taking a long, slow journey through the book of Acts to explore how the first Christians encountered the disruptive presence of the Holy Spirit. Hi, David. It's great to be back with another podcast. And uh, last time we left our glorious image of Paul sitting down and teaching in Corinth. That was a great insight. And if our, any anyone just jumping into this podcast and hasn't listened to the previous one, where we covered verses 9 through to 11 of chapter 18. My goodness, some gorgeous reflections there, totally touched and moved by many of the things we reflected on. And I just love that image of Paul sitting down in the confidence of the word of the Lord, confidence to proclaim that word and stay for 18 months and teaching Corinth. It's a beautiful, it's a, a beautiful podcast together. I did enjoy it. Paul the teacher, it was, and 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 the the God encouraged teacher, you know mm. that that he is he is sat there teaching these people the word of God because that's what God is, has has yeah. shaped him to do, and it was, it was lovely. It's some so, so many so many interesting insights into how 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 God works with Paul, and then how Paul works in the silence from God sometimes. Indeed. So I. Yeah. I enjoyed that a lot as well. And uh, but the temperature is about to turn back up again in Corinth. We're indeed, gonna... <laughs> indeed. And and maybe then we realize why this profound and powerful word from the Lord was given. You know, we, mm. it is an outstanding mm. and we we talked up reflected on the fact that it was almost uh, outstanding not only in content but slightly outstanding in behavior. That the generally Paul, Barnabas, Silas these Boys and girls just get on with the job mm. unless the Lord intervenes. And the Lord, we felt, had intervened here at Corinth and spoken. Uh, and, of course, there was a little rumbling from the Jewish synagogue before the word came. Then we have this word coming and then this kicks off. So it it might show us why why this powerful word is given to Paul because of what is about to happen. And, and, and you're going to read those verses from about verse 12 to verse 17. And that Sounds sort of good. brings this little mini episode in Corinth to a conclusion. But yeah. So here we have it. Acts 18 verse 12. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourself. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul. And Gallio showed no concern whatever. <laughs> yeah, I think Gallio was just glad to get that off his hands, mate. I think, okay, okay, get this off my, get this out of my court. I, I need to move. You also, on. You also no. get the slight impression that Luke is not a fan of Gallio. <laughs> no, no, it's. Uh, yeah, very, very interesting sort of dynamic. And of course, it, it, in terms of what's interesting about Gallio, that he did rule as proconsul around about uh, 51, 52 AD in that area. So it does help us again. I, we, we've already yes. referenced some little dating issues around Athens and Corinth. Mm -hmm. So it does place it, it places it fairly consistently. Yes around this dynamic because he had quite a short time as proconsul so we, mm. we we can we can date it quite precisely that yeah. that it's that Paul's probably mid you know somewhere yeah. around mid 50s to mid 51 that this yeah. is happening so it's hugely yeah. helpful for new testament it, historians it's very helpful and of course I'm not quite sure why his reign was so short but if uh, if this is an example of how he dealt with people, if, then maybe maybe that's part of the part of the reason. But it it does play in favour 
of Paul and the church here. So it's really, so keeping this in context of the word that's just been spoken. So to remind our listeners of the words God speaks to Paul, he says this, I'm with you. No one is going to attack you or harm you because I have many people in the city. Now, it looks like initially, oh, hold on a minute. This word's about to go pear-shaped. God has just told Paul, no one's going to attack you and harm you. And the next thing we have, this certainly in the NIV, the language is the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul. But actually, by the end of the story, it has played out to uh, affirm and confirm the word of the Lord in many ways, in that there was no actual attack on Paul. There's accusations made, but not an attack or harming in an aggressive mm-hmm. manner. So it's quite it's quite interesting that we'll have to keep we'll have to keep reminding ourselves of the word from the Lord while we're mm-hmm. negotiating our way through the this this sort of episode with the proconsul. Uh, although Sosthenes may have hoped that the word f- for Paul also is stretched as far as him. <laughs> Indeed. He, he, Indeed. Did, yeah, he did not get the same. I, I actually think the whole, I was reflecting on this, John, that the whole previous section that we've taken the last couple of podcasts about is important to bear in mind as you read the Gallio. Uh, I was going to say trial scene, but it doesn't really even seem to get off the ground as a mm. trial, does it? But, mm. but no. But it struck me that, you know, this debate is happening. I mean, I'm being a little facetious, but I don't not with not from within the text. But this debate is happening at two at two houses next door to each other. Yeah. Uh, yeah, So, so, I mean, and this is actually a fascinating thing in early Christian studies, where, uh, like, I used to ask my students when I was teaching. At New Testament, I used to ask them, when did Christians decide that they weren't Jews? Yeah. <laughs> when yeah. did Jews decide that Christians weren't Jews? Mm. And when did the rest of the world decide that mm. Christians weren't Jews? And now the first two questions require a lot of thinking about and uh, and wondering about, or rather, I, I think a better way to word that would have been when are when did Jewish Christians think that about themselves? Mm. But one mm. of the things we can see from history is the outside world struggled to del- tell the difference between Jews and Christians until the second century. Right? Mm. So they're, 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 as far as they were concerned, yeah, they all look the same. Yes, and notice here in Corinth, you have a synagogue. And then a church next door, right? We learned that in the last few episodes, didn't we? And now you've got Gallio saying, this appears to be an internal Jewish theological debate. I yeah, cannot yeah. understand why you're bringing this to to the court to, to sort out. But his yeah. perception is not two different religions are fighting. His perception is there's a theological debate within the one religion. Yes. And I think that what what's fascinating about that is two religions fighting would be of concern to Gallio, right? yes. because that's the Very sort good. of thing that descends into rioting. That's the sort of thing that descends into chaos in the city. So the proconsul is going to weigh in on that. Mm. But he can't see, <laughs> mm. even though there's a suggestion that the 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 accusation is suggesting division. He can't see the division as a, a member of the state. Does that make sense? It does. It's a brilliant observation, actually. It's a really helpful way of seeing that. And actually, it, it, as you were as you were saying that, my my mind went to the sort of similar. There's a moment where Paul eventually appears before Agrippa. So he's engaged with Festus later on. I mean, we'll get to that in about 2028, probably. <laughs> but in Acts chapter 25, I think it is. And, and I think Festus says something like this. I just looked it up there, but, but had certain questions against him on their own superstition mm. and of one Jesus, which was dead. So even Festus, and we're now in the chapter 25 of Acts, Festus as a Roman representative is still, he's struggling to see the difference between this Jewish worldview and this sect within Judaism worldview. Mm -hmm. And he's certainly not seeing it as a distinctly Christian ecclesia in the way that that we see today. So your observation and questions that you posit 
really, really provocative. I, I love those questions. You know, when did when did sort of people stop seeing followers of Jesus as Jews and see them as Christians? That's a really, really, really fascinating moment. But of course, in the likes of Corinth, where you have diverse community, and we've got mm-hmm. now even layered into that this literalism of moving from one place to another. Mm-hmm. Almost next door to each other. It does feel like, oh, separations are starting to take place in, in a way that certainly internally, if not externally, real differences are being seen. But mm-hmm. the Roman state definitely struggles to differentiate between Judaism and this this apparent sect, splinter mm-hmm. group within Judaism, the people of the way. And and I find that there's also I mean I I I may be <laughs> I found I, I'm I'm a little overwhelmed by this text because there's so many things that it's it's kind of triggering in my thinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm going to try and start somewhere, and 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 you can help keep me on the side uh, on the side of being clear mm. <laughs> before yeah. I get too lost. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't help but think about. The vision that Paul has, I am with you, mm. and do not be afraid. But thinking about that, not just within Paul's world, but within the world of Scripture, okay? Mm. And and this might seem hugely tenuous, but but here we go anyway. I couldn't help but think about the problem that Israel faces during the time of Isaiah, right? Mm. Where Israel's contemplating going to Egypt to have help and back up. And Isaiah's like, Isaiah says to Egypt, it says to Israel, like Egypt, <laughs> do you not remember them? <laughs> like, yeah. like they caused us some huge problems. Why are yeah. you going back to a people who are oppressing you to get yeah. help with your latest problem? And yeah. I couldn't help but think that's exactly what's happening here as well, right? That mm. the Roman empire has been no friend of the people of Israel, right? You know, this is happening while there's Roman soldiers stationed in Jerusalem, right? Mm. So there's an irony that they are are going to the state for help. Yeah. And then, of course, there's then further irony. And again, to echo something we said in a podcast just a couple of episodes ago, this is about the situation in Corinth. It's not a comment on Jewish political situation right now in any sense of the word. But there's an irony then that when they go to the state... The synagogue leader Sosthenes, who I can only assume is the one who has led the decision to go to the state, mm. ends up getting beat up by the crowd, right? Mm. Which is exactly what Isaiah makes the point to Israel that like Egypt is not a good friend to make. These are the mm. people that enslaved us once. What do you think will happen again? Now, I- I'm not trying to say that Luke directly has that in mind. But this seems to be a constant theme throughout scripture that mm. when you try to turn to the state for help, yeah. when you should be relying on God, it won't go well for you. Yeah. And, and I couldn't help but read the text and wonder if Luke's pondering this, because we know Luke knows scripture very, very yeah. well. And we know he knows Isaiah very well. I find it hard, John, to suggest that Luke doesn't see the irony of this. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, if you think of the big backdrop, it's a fascinating observation. I'd never seen that connection before that you've drawn out with the Isaiah situation and, and the similarities are it's really profound. I'll have to really think about that and meditate on that. Um, but of course, if you look at the big story as well behind the book of Acts, he is writing to Theophilus, mm. real person or representation of Gentile world, Roman world, a sponsor of the book of Acts. And and at one level, of course, the book of Acts is an apologetic for Christianity. It's an apologetic mm. for the followers of the way. But yet within that, Luke's not afraid to show. I mean, he's trying to show that Christianity as a movement, Rome has nothing to fear at a political level from Christianity. But you know, because of the type of movement it is. But he's, but he's also not afraid to just keep showing you that that actually the system that this that we are living under and the system that we are operating under. Is, is not our friend. Mm. There are things mm. that we can take advantage of. There are things that we can benefit from. But 
there is a cautious, continuous reminder that the state uh, is its pri primary agenda of the state is the state, right? And ultimately, um, will will operate with a pragmatism that ensures its citizens comply to whatever it wants ultimately, especially a totalitarian state like Rome. So we've seen this repeated a few times and we'll see it again later on with Paul when he's going through that whole I appeal to Caesar conversation mm. and where all of that goes. So it's a fascinating insight and and one that even we need to remind ourselves of today in a modern 21st century world that actually, you know, to quote a, a magnificent psalm, hopefully not out of context, but I look to the hills from where does my help come? Mm. The psalmist asks, you know, like, where is my help coming from? Is my help come from, to use your Isaiah reference, Egypt? Does mm. my help come from Rome? Does my help come from, and fill in the blanks? Yeah. No, he says, the writer says, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, which is ultimately Isaiah's appeal. It's at mm -hmm. the heart of the vision that the Lord has given to Paul. I'm with you. Don't be afraid. Yes. I'll take care of you. I'll watch over you. Don't play the system, but let me take care of you in the system. And I think it's a beautiful reminder that as humans, even as following Jesus humans, we are prone to rush to the obvious places, the horses and the chariots, the mm. state, the experts, the superpowers who will protect us. And actually, you know, the Bible, even in this narrative, reminds us that their agenda in protecting us may not always be a healthy or good one in that context and, and, and that we should be looking to someone beyond that. So I, I think there's nuances in there worthy of consideration mm. without me saying things I shouldn't be saying. Yeah, I, th and that's really what I was scratching at. It's it, it's hard to, you know, you can't cross reference your way back to Isaiah from this text. But thematically, it it was that's what struck me exactly as you draw. It struck me that mm. oh, we we are seeing this from Luke. Luke definitely, mm. if he has sort of sub points when he's writing. He, you would tend to think that he wants you to pick that up. That mm. I actually, while you were saying that, I, I went looking for. There's a line in in Jennings' commentary, which he said he says this, which I think is really helpful in this conversation. He says the problem is not that the church should be oblivious to the well-being of the state. Right. Mm. The problem is that churches have felt and continue to feel compelled to make the case to the state that yeah. what is important for our well-being should be important for the state. And then he says this, we should never imagine such a hoped for synergy of concern. Right? Yes. Uh, Very good. That, but, just, but, just say that again, that last bit. Just say that last so bit again. We should never, never imagine such a hoped for synergy of concern. Mm -hmm. you, 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 so, 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 so we may... We may occasionally find that the state is helpful to us, but let's not. But what Jennings seems to be saying, let's not assume assume that the state are helping us for the same reason as we want to be Absolutely. helped. Yeah. But then he pushes it, and I think this is this is. He says, <laughs> he said, nor should we ever equate our churchy struggles with the struggles of the world, <laughs> which I think is yeah. a really fascinating way to say. And he goes on to explain how the role of the state is to care for the well being of its citizens and of its creation. Mm. So, so he then says that we, the church, press the state for the flourishing of the world and not for the flourishing of the church, because God will see to the latter, right? Which, I mean, I think it's profound theology at that point. So, so the church, when the church sees the state failing its citizens, when the church mm. sees the state doing what is not causing the world to flourish, he seems to be suggesting the church based on what you see in Acts, can say, hey, wait, this is wrong, right? And we think this is wrong and we're aligning with it's wrong. But the church must be careful to never assume that the state is going to protect it. That's jo God's job, which goes back to the vision. No one is going to attack you and harm you. N not because the state's looking after you, Paul, but because I am with you. And, and so I, I, and I, I don't know if that helps at this particular moment, but oh. I thought Jennings was really precise there for us. Superb. I mean, I'm I, I'm I'm loath to even be, try to add anything. That I think that's a, that's mm. really superb in terms of e even today in our modern world and the interactions between 
church and state, I think those sorts of conversations are deeply, deeply mm. helpful. And, and, you know, again, treading carefully, if, if the state becomes our protector, then, then we generally find ourselves beholden in the mm. wrong way to the state. Mm. And then the church finds itself in a world it was never designed to be. And, and mm. negotiating conversations and brokering solutions in a way it was never meant to broker mm. and, and bring solutions. And, and I see that so much in our world, in my own world, in my own wonderful country and across places where the church has the freedom to express itself in maybe more democratic settings. We, we look to the state for things that are God's. Mm. Mm. And, and I just, you know, I, I'm I, I'm really like challenged in a way I didn't expect to be in this podcast. I I I'm finding myself, wow, that's profound. That mm. is absolutely mm. profound. And I, I and and of course, in in many ways, Paul's situation with Rome looks a bit more stark because Rome Rome was this superpower totalitarian state. So, mm. so you know, you, you'd have to be very, very careful how and what you do and say uh, mm -hmm. in the context of that. But, yeah. of course, the principles apply across every relationship between any church community and the governing powers on, under which it finds itself. That we're, we're there to encourage our state to think about the flourishing of all people. I thought that was a beautiful... Mm. A beautiful thought, not to get the state to leverage our particular agenda. Mm. My goodness, my goodness, that's that's yeah, that that if, if hopefully that makes our listeners think in the way that's made me think in a very, very specific way. That's very powerful. I find that very mm. powerful. And and this is where I do I don't think we're stretching Luke warning of us, us of this no. because because of verse 17 well 16 and 17 he drove them off right yeah. which is I mean, it's very strong very you strong. know it's very strong he expelled them from yeah. the judgment seat and yeah. uh, i mean that's the, i mean the greeks a little a little harsher than that than you know the niv has he drove them off but but the Greek gives us, you know, but he expelled them from the judgment seat. Then the crowd, we don't know who this crowd are. Are the crowd the people that came from the synagogue with Sosthenes? Mm. I mean, I'm tempted to think it's just the mob that are there because of <laughs> Luke's use of the crowd. You know, it's not, yes, yes. he doesn't reference, oh, the, you know, the Jewish people turned on Sosthenes. It almost, and, and partly why I'm drawn to the translation that it's just the mob, is that this is what happens, right? Yeah. Is uh, and and I want to, and perhaps I'm being too pointed when I say this, but but you've got you've got an inter-Jewish debate as far as the state is concerned, and to be fair, as far as Paul is concerned at this point, yeah. he's still until right. this point turning up at That's synagogue right. saying Jesus is your is is our Messiah. It's too. It's two theological positions that are quite literally next door to each other. Yeah, yeah. That we have spilled that debate out into the public sphere. Indeed. And indeed. think now the state should be interested in our debate, all the while the state is not being introduced to the God who's revealed to us in Christ, right? Yeah. And I think about how often we as Christians have these nuanced arguments on social media or draw the world into our you know, inter-Christian theological debate as if, you know, as if anyone in the world can tell the difference between one group of Anglicans or Baptists or Pentecostals from another group of Anglicans yeah. or Baptists or Pentecostals. And then, and then Luke seems to offer us this warning that ultimately then that will turn on you. And, and Galileo, Galileo shows no concern whatsoever. No concern. That when the chips are actually down, the one group of people are being beat up by uh, in the presence of the other group of people from next door and the state is going to do nothing to stop it. You know, right. I, I don't know. I mean, it's poignant, isn't it? it, it there's it's a warning poignant. to us in this, isn't there? Is. There? I love that, David. And, you know, I, I thought, I thought the way you just positioned that, that if we, 
take things into the BEMA, into the courtroom, in, into the judgment hall that actually um, should be the remit of the Lord or trusting the state to do what actually the Lord has promised to do, then, then we end up almost abdicating. We hand something over potentially to both state and, and mob that allows a leverage into the world of the church that, that actually is deeply, deeply unhelpful. And and I, 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 I do think you see that profoundly in certain areas where we're, I mean, be careful what I say here, where, where the mob is invited into things that actually they, you know, that that voice or that influence shouldn't be heard. Uh, and we should have the wisdom to be able to, to contend as we should. So uh, profound, profound insights. I, I, I've been really challenged deeply mm. by that. But uh, if I can just change gears slightly. Can, can I hold and, you from changing gears just to make oh, one point it. really quickly? Yeah, go sir. for it. Yeah, uh, it, go for it, it. Just as you were saying that there, in all of my reflections on this story and in Isaiah, it was only when you were saying it just there that <laughs> this is embarrassing. I went a different direction, but I think it's important. It just struck me. And, and why has this not come to me? Here's my admission, listeners. Why has this not come to me quicker? I'm supposed to be a Pauline scholar. It's 1 Corinthians verse 6, chapter 6, mm -hmm. that Paul mm -hmm. says this, when any of you has a grievance against another, do you dare take it to the court before the unrighteous instead of taking it to the saints? Mm -hmm. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Uh, which always makes me laugh because I, I feel like, no, I didn't know that, Paul. <laughs> and, uh, and, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels to say nothing of ordinary matters? If you have ordinary cases, then do you appoint as judges those who have no standing in the church? And then he says this, verse 7, in fact, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud and bereavers at that. And I just, I mean, it's poignant and it's sharp. Yeah. And, and, and I yeah. want to be careful of not saying what I'm not trying to say. But you can't help but wonder if this scene that we've just read in Acts mm. 18 is shaping Paul's advice later to the Corinthian church Absolutely. when he's sort of saying to him, listen, I know what happens when you try and get Gallio to sort out your inter-church debates. Yeah. I mean, sorry to yeah. just squeeze that in, John, when you wanted to no, move no, the conversation. I but brilliant. No, I wonder if that helps. No. I, I think that's brilliant. I think, and of course, the irony is that some of the people now in the church at Corinth that Paul is writing to may well have been there. You know, they may have been yes. they may have been there in that very event and come to faith, or heard about this event or whatever. So, I, I no, no, I I don't think I I don't think that was a squeeze in. I think it's a it's a great observation and a very poignant one. And again, sometimes. Again, as a little aside here, it's worthwhile our listeners when tracking certain New Testament letters, especially to do with Paul, if there is a story or narrative about about how those communities formed in the book of Acts, it's always worthwhile connecting the two together. So, yes. you know, when he writes to Ephesus, then read about the establishment of the church at Ephesus in the book of Acts. When he mm. when he writes to Thessalonica, think about what's going on there when mm. he writes to. So so I, I, I think you've made a beautiful connection between an actual mm. event and a piece of profound and very helpful and I would say again, nuanced practical advice. There's there's a sense in which Paul, at a very simple level, is saying, right, don't be going to court for stuff you shouldn't be going to court for. There could be another level at which Paul is saying, actually, there are certain things the state can't help you with. This mm, is not a mm. state issue. This is a Jesus issue. This is a Lord issue. And you've got to settle that somewhere else. It's not, He's not just discouraging people from having proper good legal practice, but maybe mm. taking issues to, to the Bema of Galileo that actually should be kept for somewhere else. So I think it's a brilliant point. Great observation, David. My my, my only, as, as maybe we're drawn to close on this little podcast, my only little observation was a hope-filled one just at the end. Mm. Then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue ruler. Two little observations that I could be off beam on, but I'll throw them in. Mm. We've got the second mention of a synagogue leader here. We've already met Crispus, who seems to be the leader, but follows Paul next door. 
And we know from First Corinthians, Paul baptizes Christmas. And, and that's a beautiful, a beautiful thought. And then we get this gorgeous, almost repeat idea. So we get Sosthenes, who's now the synagogue leader. And yet when we again flip to First Corinthians and chapter, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Come on. It's amazing. <laughs> Come on now. So, so, so you get this lovely, we've now got, even though, and I love this from a broad missional point of view, but also from, from Paul's own passion. We talked a couple of podcasts ago about Paul's passion uh, in the book of Romans for, for his own people. And yet in the midst of, of feeling that he's been driven next door, in the midst of his frustration that his own people have rejected the Messiah or are rejecting the Messiah, we get two gorgeous bits of information within the text of Crispus and Sosthenes, both ironically influential within their synagogue and both who become followers of Jesus. Some, some even suggest that uh, Sosthenes may have helped Paul actually pen and write 1 Corinthians. But you get this gorgeous, uh, Sosthenes, our brother, and later on, Crispus, who I baptized. And you go, wow, just right there. If we put the two pieces of text together, you're seeing something hope-filled in the midst of mm. some controversy and difficulty. I love it. It's interesting, actually, how... I mean, I, I was I was hoping we would get to mention that Sosthenes piece because it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful connection that's there. I, I was mm. actually, I was at a... A seminar just yesterday, John, with with Steve Walton. Now, Steve is currently writing the Word Biblical Commentary on Acts, and um, oh wow! Okay. And so he was passing through Calgary because he's he's teaching over at Regent College in Vancouver this summer, and and so I, I jumped in to to listen to his seminar. And one of the things that he said in this, there was many things that he said, which I'll probably sneak out over coming episodes of of of, of two texts. But one of the things he said, which I think I intuitively, you kind of know, but it was really fascinating to see somebody throw up on one slide, is that there's about 50, depending on how you count, there's about 50 different people that Paul mentions across his letters and journeys, mm -hmm. many of whom we only know their names, right? Yeah, and, and we don't know the sub story, but occasionally we get these beautiful moments where we see their names in a couple of places. Sosthenes is, you know, being one that, that you, this person appears and we're definitely, Luke wants us to know their name. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm. And I think this is important for our readers to, to our listeners, sorry, our listeners to, to, to just hold with is that, you know, this is not the same as bumping in to somebody called, you know, Jim in one letter <laughs> and another Jim in another letter. Yeah, yeah. Notice how Luke has gone out of his way to mm. name Sosthenes. And yeah. He wants you to know that yeah. there was a Sosthenes there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because he thinks that's important to mm -hmm. you. And, mm -hmm. and, and my suggestion would be that the reason is because the people who are reading this from Corinth know Sosthenes, that yeah. Sosthenes has some, you, you, you know, some, some awareness amongst people. And then by the time we get this letter, Sosthenes is, well, I mean, think about, think about it like this. Sosthenes is traveling with Paul now because Indeed. he's he, he's not in Corinth. He's wherever mm -hmm. Paul is writing mm -hmm. back to Corinth. Mm -hmm. And we see this. I mean, it's also interesting that, in, that given that we're having the conversation about Corinth in in Romans, we, we encounter this reference to Erastus, mm -hmm. the city treasurer or the steward mm -hmm. of the city or something like that. Of, mm -hmm. And what's really interesting is back in the, I think, late 1920s, so it was the, the excavations were slightly interrupted by the Second World War, but they found an excavation in Corinth from the first century that references Erastus, right? Wow. So, so now scholars are divided over whether it's the same Erastus, but it's yeah. it's the Erastus. It says that there's an inscription, and it says Erastus. It, it seems to be he paid for whatever is being paid paved at this particular point, these stones. But he says he did it at his own expense. And wow. so the scholars 
think that this is because the scholars that think it's the same Erastus is because he was the city treasurer and he makes a donation to the city to get something done. He wants it to be known. I didn't steal the money from the city (laughs) in order to build this thing. I paid for this myself. So you've now got this potential where it's really exciting is that Paul's time in Corinth, by the end of his time in Corinth, the synagogue, two of the synagogue leaders are now part of, are now believers. The city treasurer is now a believer. There's yeah. a there's a quartus that seems to have some sort of Roman uh, significance uh, that's going on. So this year and a half in Corinth, there's several significant like mm. city changing people mm. have become, which is interesting. And I wonder if that's why in Corinthians Paul makes the point: not many of you were yeah. rich, not many. Yeah. That actually some of them were significant yeah. players, and yeah. maybe that had made the problem that some people thought there was a hierarchy within the church or something mm. like that. So that Sosthenes things draws us to pay attention to certain things in Corinth that are really interesting. Yeah, brilliant, and and it goes back again to that word from the Lord, doesn't it? That mm. we spent so much time on in our first podcast with this little connection these two we've been sitting yeah. together that actually I have many people in this city. Mm. And and what a thought that those many were uh, people who were wealthy and influential. Those, th- those many were Jew as well as mm. Gentile. Those many were also those who would be regarded as, as sort of lower sections of society. But God has these many people. And, and even in these lovely connections between the Acts narrative and letters like those written to the church of Corinth, we're seeing even how the Lord is at work in in you know difficult moments. Paul has to leave the synagogue and goes next door, and then when he settles next door, he's dragged you know to the bema, and there's the threatening attack. And yet, in the midst of it all, the Lord orchestrates all of this in His providential love, His providential care, so that the many people in the city. Uh, come to this wonderful place of freedom and faith and hope and uh, my goodness what what an encouragement that is to us all to keep going because the Lord has many people in our cities so that's it for this episode we know that there's always more to explore and we encourage you to dive into the text and do that if you like this episode we'd really appreciate it if you rated reviewed or shared it We also appreciate all of our listeners who financially support the show, sharing the weight of producing this podcast. If you'd like to support the show, visit twotexts.com. But that is all for now. So until next time, from John and I, goodbye. Goodbye.